I, in a weird way, ended up sitting in the passenger seat of my own life because I had said yes to all these other things. Like all of a sudden I wasn't in control anymore. Like someone else was driving. You get all these accolades and you win these President's Club awards and they send you off on trips to Hawaii or London or wherever and, and then they give you these promotions and you start climbing this corporate ladder and you get to this point where it gets scary to look down. So you just keep climbing up. My two very close friends, Joshua Fields Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus, better known as The Minimalists, are on the podcast today. Nearly four years ago, I got an email from Josh. The subject line was simply idea. He wanted to make a documentary about something he was passionate about. My answer was pretty simple as well. Hell yes. We set off around the country interviewing with dozens of people who called themselves minimalists. Today we reflect on the film, how they made the leap from their corporate careers to becoming the minimalists full time, and we discuss their early struggles as entrepreneurs. You're listening to The Ground Up Show, a podcast that inspires creatives to make meaningful content and pursue their passions. My name is Matt Diavella, and I'm a filmmaker best known for the Netflix documentary Minimalism. And I'm sitting down with creators to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how to make an impact. So as you guys know, in this podcast, I, I talk with guests about their stories, their ground up stories, how they built something from nothing, uh, how they turn their lives around. And it's kind of interesting because we made a documentary together called Minimalism. And that's like our ground up show, basically. It's, it's your story of starting with nothing and, and kind of going the suit and tie corporate guy nine to five route and then becoming the minimalist. So we can just transition to the 79 minutes of audio from the documentary. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to cut out Sam Harris and Dan Harris and then we'll just have just nothing but you guys in it. Yeah. I got to tell you, man, I'm, I'm still upset that you named this podcast the ground up show as opposed to the initial accidental title that you you had. When you first emailed me, you said, I'm thinking about doing this podcast, and you're just looking to see some of our best practices or whatever, and and you said, um, because everybody, because the world needs another podcast. And I'm like, that's the perfect title <laughs> that for is a, a good podcast. One. That's and I mean, if someone's listening to this now, they're already like... It's gone. I got to get that stealing. domain name. Yeah. I know, right? I think it's a funny idea, and I've been using it as a tagline in some of my videos, right. but I'm just not sure if I want to commit to that as like forever. You know what I mean? Because when you build something, you kind of have to stick to that name. Not, not necessarily. So, uh, this it's, po- podcast was to um, Joe Budden's podcast, and uh, it used to be called, I'll name this podcast later, and... I think it was like the first 120 episodes. It was yeah. called I'll Name This Podcast Later. And now it's just the Bo- Joe Budden podcast. But Oh, so he did reach. Yeah, he changed he it. He eventually changed it. But I love the first name. I'll Name This Podcast Later was perfect. Or Because the World Needs Another Podcast was, was perfect. So welcome to everyone to episode number one of Because the World Needs Another Podcast. <laughs> That's it. That's it. This is the, the kind of mentoring that I need right now. <laughs> uh, so... I don't, I don't want to like cover everything that we talked about in the documentary and, and everything that you guys have covered already, though there's going to be a lot of overlap. Mm. But I do want to talk about entrepreneurship, um, like how you guys started The Minimalist and how you were able to turn that into something you, you do full time, which is pretty incredible and which is, I think, uh, what a lot of people would love to be able to do. It's sure. not it's not like the only route, the only recipe to, to kind of create your own audience and um, build your own business, but it's certainly one that I think is attractive to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so I do want to cover that. But before we get into it, can you guys, as like a business, as the minimalist.com, how do you guys split up your duties and, and what do you do like on a day-to-day basis? I guess both the, the macro and the micro. Yeah, I, I don't. It, everything is is yeah. fifty fifty to some extent, but when you look at the, sort of the the division of responsibilities, but that might mean some things. Like I was just talking to Bex, my my partner, yesterday, and we we just announced this Australian tour, and so we're headed to four cities in Australia and New Zealand, and uh, um, she was like. I said I gotta stop. I gotta stop the car, and we, we need to. Uh, I need to like respond to some emails. There were some issues with the, the ticket links or whatever, and uh, because I manage our relationship with our booking agent, and then Ryan you know, will manage other relationships. So I think the plan for us is quite often we work together at least 
ostensibly or pu- when we're public facing, but a lot of the background stuff is like, oh, you take this, I'll take this. And yeah, or Sean takes it, or Jess will take it, or we true. will have you do stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have a whole team of people who we kind of, uh, yeah, utilize and delegate and, and kind of split up responsibilities. But I mean, if you look, like, if you look at Sean Harding, who, I mean, he's kind of, he was our first official employee. You look at his job title, and it depends on which day uh, you, you look at it. I mean, one day he could be our tour manager. Another day he could be our director of operations. The next day he's our book editor. The day after that he's our website editor. It's just good to have a team of people who can, who are very versatile and can do a lot of things. And then we just kind of, yeah, throw stuff each other's way and pick up stuff. And yeah, there's no specific title or, or duties that I could like list off. Right. And I think that like what you touched on is there's a difference between work that you do with others, like the collaborating, coming up with ideas, deciding on whether to do a documentary or start a podcast versus sitting down, doing the writing, doing the work, uh, mentoring. And there's a lot of stuff that, you know, it's difficult to do as two people. Yeah. I mean, I think the writing thing is, is a good example of that. I mean, Mm -hmm. we've written a lot of stuff together, but it's usually, we're not like in the same room together when we do it. Like, Ryan will come up with an idea and I will try to shape that into something or I will write something and say, hey, what are your thoughts on this? Or we'll have a discussion about a topic and that will manifest in a writing six months, eight months later um, because that that idea often needs sort of like a, a gestation period. And so writing is something that is often a very solo act. It requires solitude. It requires... Um, for me, it requires early mornings. It requires um, a willingness to to sit down and put in the work because for me, writing is really difficult. And and uh, it, it always cracks me up when someone comes, I've got this great idea for an essay I want you to write. I'm like, wow, you just asked <laughs> for 12 hours of my time, basically. Right. right. Um, and, and so... It, it takes me a long time to do something like that, but it's also the thing that I enjoy most once I once I get it going. You know, Ryan and I, over the years, have accidentally sort of piled on these things. They're not it's not an actual accident, but like we didn't plan it this way. Um, we've done it very intentionally. We've decided to say yes to certain things, but it started off as a website where we were just writing stuff, and then eventually it was like, hey, let's write a book because people kept asking, like, hey, when are you going to come out with your book? Right. You're like, well, we're the minimalists, so let's put out a book and we've done three books together now and after that we started touring that was that became another thing that we started focusing on or we started focusing on um uh, doing the podcast a couple years ago and that that was just when the documentary was coming out hey this would be a great way to start talking about the documentary get people excited about it but also answer people's questions and then it turned into this whole other thing and we're over 100 episodes now of basically answering people's questions. We do live podcasts in front of crowds. And that was something we didn't expect at the very beginning. I, In fact, I didn't even like podcasts at the very beginning. But then I started to fall in love with them a few years ago and realized like, oh, like I'm not very good at this, but maybe I could, yeah, I, I'm a fairly competent writer. But when we first started podcasting compared to where we are now, it's a day and night difference. I'm sure you've seen this. You've, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. And, and yours is an extra layer because you interview people. We, we don't really interview people because, uh, well, it's terrifying to me <laughs> to think about sitting down. And, and you get to that point. Like, I remember when we, were, we were going out interviewing people for the documentary. And quite often, like, we'd sit down with someone. Like Patrick Roan, I think we sat down for five and a half hours. <laughs> right. And like six yeah. minutes makes it to the... Uh... Yeah, honestly, three hours in, I heard his stomach grumbling through my headphones. I was like, maybe we should get Patrick some food. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so I think you can do that for a documentary. You can sit there for five hours and you know you're going to get 30 great seconds out of that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it makes for a really compelling documentary because they don't see the hundreds, if not thousands of hours of mostly sunrise, sunset compilations <laughs> that... Um, hit the cutting room floor. And with a podcast, you can't really do that. You're not going to sit here with us for five hours and then put out a 30 second you know, video on you know, whatever the platform would be. It, it, it doesn't make as much sense. So you actually have to be, you have to have compelling enough questions, but, but also you have to be able to anticipate where the other person is going and how do you make that interesting considering the audience and, and all these other things. And so Ryan and I have a good dynamic. And, and, and by the way, I think it's part of the reason that our, our show is different from a lot of others is we don't, 
we haven't really done interviews up to this point and but we listen a lot we listen to what you know the audience is saying we get to interact with them whether it's live or it is like just they call in and they leave us a voicemail we both kind of started our podcast in a very similar way and that we didn't think it through. We didn't say, all right, 20 episodes in, this is probably what it's going to look like. Right. Uh, you, you didn't have a game plan. It was like, hey, this, this is like a new medium to get our message across. Let's just start. It started- Maybe it's not a game plan. Maybe it's not having an expectation. Yeah. No expectations. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think you can plan a little bit, but there's two ways that you could go. You could just over plan to the point where you just make so many excuses that you never start it that you're like, well, I need to record 10 episodes first. That way I have a little bit of leeway and I can build into right. it and I don't have to feel stressed out. And right. that's great advice if you're actually going to follow through with it. For me, it was, I just need to make one episode, mm-hmm. talk about my story about like the dumbest thing I ever did as a filmmaker, the biggest mistake I ever had, yeah. which was quite simply just not pressing record on a reality <laughs> TV show that I shot. And I was like, I think somebody might be able to like get a little bit of uh get some (laughs) advice from this and actually learn from the mistakes that i've made and i'm like maybe i can continue along with this and hear from other people and it just evolved slowly but i'm really glad that i just i didn't that i just started and it didn't wait to until everything was perfect the timing was perfect yeah i'm glad we did that too i mean you know when josh and i started to talk about doing a podcast that's all it was. Hey, let's start doing a podcast. Let's make sure that we set our standards really, really high. Let's make sure that we have, you know, good equipment uh, and, and that we have, you know, Sean there to help uh, uh, record it and to produce it. And let's put out the best podcast that we can. But there was no expectation on how many downloads or where we would be by episode 10 or 20. I mean, we, we had the same approach where it was, yeah, just one episode at a time. So I guess like entrepreneurial tip number one is... Uh, have lower your expectations, but raise your standards. Because what that means is if you're putting out your best work, then someone will will enjoy it. Uh, it doesn't mean that you know, you're going to have a, a million followers on that first podcast, but if you can put out good work and consistently, so tip number two is be consistent, and you can be consistent with that high quality of work. Like That is where uh, more people will come and they will come back because they know what to expect. They know it's a good quality uh, show. And I mean, that's that's kind of been Josh and I's approach for everything, not just the podcast, but I mean, even with the minimalists.com, 52 people showed up that first month, 52. And, you know, Josh and I, we were pretty excited. Like, great. Like 52 people came to our website. Um, we got an email or two and it was great to be able to add value to other people's lives. And then 52 turned into 500, 500 turned into 5,000. And now, you know, we're able to tell our story to millions of people every year. But it was with that same approach of, you know, our expectations were, were very low, but our standards were super high. So let's, let's go back to some of those very early days. And I want to even start before you, you started The Minimalist. And, you know, you're at that lonely lunch table, senior year of high school, trying to figure out what you want to do with your life. Decide to go down this, this corporate path and, <laughs> and set your, your eyes on making your first $50,000. Yeah. Um, you know, was the corporate path the only path that you guys saw at that point in your life and I'm also curious what success looked like for you as young fresh green 18 year olds man for me like I grew up with my dad owning his own business painting and hanging wallpaper and he got by but it was just like he was just barely getting by and I remember when I graduated high and I I worked I worked for him uh, during high school during the summers but when I graduated like my plan was to work for him and then eventually take over the business but then I like started to realize at like 18 19 years old I'm like wait a minute like I'm putting in like 40 50 hours a week and hardly getting by myself uh I don't want to take this business over and your dad was always having money problems always while he owned the business he lit- I remember one day when he was paying his taxes he wrote a letter put in his taxes he's like hey i'm sorry that my taxes are short i had to feed my family and like just wow. send in a short check holy cow i know man and it's the government never got back to him either like i don't know <laughs> if they let it slide or what but that's amazing that he wrote them a letter he wrote them a letter just don't pay yeah he was <laughs> like, he's like here's what i here's what i have like sorry i had to feed my family but you know when when i graduated high school college wasn't an option um being raised as one of jehovah's witnesses they do not encourage college the end of the world's going to be here so why would you go to college um (laughs) it's a a good point (laughs) think about how how dangerous that mindset is like growing up as a kid you were basically told like "Eh, don't worry about it go into debt forget about college 
uh, because you know we're all going to see the end of the world within the next 10 years i mean there's a lot of uh i mean this is totally an aside but th- there are a lot of cases like in the late 80s uh, or maybe early 80s i don't know the, we'll just say the 80s yeah. uh, where maybe it was the mid that organization specifically had this huge wave of um, bankruptcies in their organization because that's exactly the I mean they uh, went out and took out loans m- more than what they could afford thinking that well I'm not, I'm not gonna have to pay back this loan I'll just you know go ahead and do this and Jesus will come and, and, and save everything and fix everything wow. but anyway so so college was not an option um, I certainly couldn't afford it I never saved for it I had no idea um, I had no idea he, how how to even approach going to college. I remember like when I when I actually did go to college, I started when I was twenty five years old, and I was talking to my boss, and uh, she, this was in the corporate world because the corporation paid for one hundred percent of it. So I was like, well, I might as well go to school if they're going to pay for it. And I went to my boss and I'm like, hey, can you help me figure out how to go to college? And the look on her face was like, she's like, did no one ever sit you down like when you graduated high school and show you like how to apply? <laughs> I'm like, no, like I. Got out of high school, I started working for my dad, and realized, you know, two years into it, this sucks. Uh, I remember telling my dad, I'm like, Dad, you work this much. Some days he'd come in, dude, and he's, he's got this stress dot above his, it's like right between his eyes. And if you see that dot, you just don't talk to him, because he's so stressed out. Is it like blotchy red skin kind of thing? Yeah, and it's only at this one spot. It's really weird, right between mm-hmm. his eyes. But, but my point is, is, I remember like seeing that dot one day, and I'm like, Dad... You make X amount of dollars and you work X amount of hours a week. This doesn't make sense to me. Like, mm-hmm. there's got to be something else out there that we can do or that I can do. And you know, eventually, I was talking to Josh about what he was doing, and I remember him telling me, um, he was, yeah, he's like, I'm selling cell phones. I'm like, sweet. I'm like, how much money do you make selling cell phones? He's like, oh, I don't know. I think this 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 month I made like sixty five hundred bucks, seven thousand bucks. This is back in two thousand and one, and he was. In Ohio, yeah, and and he was and he's you know twenty years old, twenty one, and I'm like, I thought he was lying. I'm like, dude, no way. I blew it off for months and months, um, maybe even a year or so. I just remember, uh, I was in Josh's wedding and we got to, uh, you know, we we were talking more and more about, um, me doing something different. I hated what I was doing at the time, and finally I was like, all right, dude, I'll try it out, and yeah, like that first month I made like. Actually, that's not true. Remember the first couple months? It was like the slow, yeah, <laughs> slow. Period. You were doing about you were. Anyway, were you thinking about firing? My they, hand? No, like, no, 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 no. No, it wasn't his no, fault. The, the entire company oh, was okay. just slow. Yeah, it was just it was just a really weird time. But that first commission check I got, um, it was a couple months later, and it was like forty five hundred bucks. And the first thing I did is I went and bought a new truck. I was like, sweet <laughs> mm-hmm. man, I can af- I can afford a down payment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to get you another really payment. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, it was it, it was an interesting. Uh, it was an interesting uh, start to to uh, a new career. I mean, I was really excited, and I, you know, for all intents and purposes, man, I loved it for the first you know couple few years. But you know, it gets it, it wears on you after a while. What was the question again? I <laughs> I, I tried to drop out of high school, and um, oh, that's right. Uh, my my the counselor, you know, the the high school counselor. You basically go to him and talk to him about why you want to drop out, and part of the reason was like all the friends in my my neighborhood had already dropped out, um, at least most of them, and it was my senior year, and I was just like so done, and I wanted I knew I wanted to do something in business, but but I also knew that that I I wasn't going the college route, and I'm like this high school thing is it doesn't make any sense. I'm I was already like 17 at the time, and I wanted to just move on. And he he got to the point where he he wouldn't let me drop out of high school, um, but I got I, he was able to convince me that basically he could stack my whole schedule with a bunch of study halls, and I'd take two or three classes to graduate. And he let me take off the entire second semester of of my senior year of high school because otherwise he knew I was done. But I knew I wasn't going to go to college, and so I went out and got full time job, sales job. And that's when I started climbing the corporate ladder. And it was weird. I just said yes to this thing because of, of money. That was the primary driver. We all need to make money. And I said, like, well, here's the best opportunity to make money. But I didn't really know what I was going to do with the money. I thought I was so unhappy growing up because we didn't have any money. We were really poor, food stamps, government assistance. And, 
and money would obviously solve all of my problems. If I could just have enough money, then, then I would be happy. And then of course, I, by age 19, I was making more money than I ever saw my parents make when I, when I was growing up. You know, my dad wasn't around. It was just my mom raising me. And so I had debt for the first time. It's not like I was making great money. I, I was more broke than I was a year prior because I had these credit cards that showed up in the mail. And then I started renting out a nicer apartment and realized, like, I was saying yes to everything that looked appetizing to my life right it, it was it was appealing at the time and so I in a weird way ended up sitting in the passenger seat of my own life where because I had said yes to all these other things like all of a sudden I wasn't in control anymore like someone else was driving it was the credit cards the job that I started work I was working 80 hours a week and I I was really good at it too. And that was another problem. You get all these accolades and you win these president's club awards and they send you off on trips to Hawaii or London or wherever. And, and then they give you these promotions and you start climbing this corporate ladder and you get to this point where it gets scary to look down. So you just keep climbing up. And I was the youngest director in my company's history by age 27, 140 year old telecom company. And I got really close to the guys I aspired to be like. I had a whole plan in place. I was going to be a uh, vice president by age 32, which is really young now. Um, I was going to be a senior vice president by age 35, a C-level executive by age 40. Like That was my plan as I, as I was climbing. But it all started at when I was 18 and decided I'm going to go this path. It wasn't a deliberate path. It was just a I'll say yes to this, I guess. And I think that's okay, especially when you're young, to say yes to a bunch of things early on, but keep questioning those things. And that's where I, I ran astray. I wasn't questioning any of it. Well, this is the path I'm supposed to take. I've already gotten this far, uh, and so I'll keep climbing. And But as I got closer to those guys, I really aspired to be like, like I really want to be the CFO one day, or COO is what I really wanted to be. And, but as I got closer to some of these guys, man, they were miserable heart attacks and third divorces and and huge money problems even though they were making seven figures some of them uh, or really close to it and then I realized that well if I follow that same path I'm going to end up in the same place I think we all tell ourselves like well I'll be different but why if you if you follow the same recipe you're going to bake the same cake as someone else and so that's kind of where 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 I ended up and in, in this place of not true discontent but of a place of, of dissatisfaction, um, and, and it lacked anything meaningful to me. And so, of course, I tried to pacify myself with, with pleasure, basically. It sounds like minimalism came at the perfect time for you, because given the choice at 18 years old, where it's like, hey, do you want all this money, right. or do you want minimalism? <laughs> right. Like, I don't think you would have chosen minimalism at that point in your life. Um, but you, you'd gone through a lot of... Uh, experience and, and you, you saw for yourself what worked and what didn't work. Was it that you, you knew that you were dis discontent or was it minimalism that helped pull you out of that and realize that this wasn't for you? Well, there's nothing wrong with money. First off, like I think money can be great. It allows you to accomplish a lot if you use it deliberately. The problem that I had throughout my twenties is yeah, I grew up poor and I thought the reason we were discontented is we didn't have money. The reason we were actually discontented is we made repeated bad decisions with the little money that we did have. And I just carried those decisions forward into my 20s. Ha had I made good decisions with that money, there was a point in my career where I was making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in, in Dayton, Ohio, uh, which we're out in Los Angeles now. I don't can't even imagine what that would be like. Like here, you, you, you it, it's you know, orders of magnitude different. But, but the point being is if I would have made better decisions with that money, then... I think I still could have led a meaningful life. You, you can be a rich person and, and live a meaningful life. You can be a poor person and live a meaningful life. I've seen both sides of, of the spectrum. Minimalism showed up at a time for me where it, it felt like I got into those two car crashes. You know, my, my marriage ended, my mother died both in the same month. And, and, and you know, it feels like you get just, t-boned at a light and then someone else rams into you right after that but then there was almost like this after the accident someone ran over my foot because i realized like no i wasn't very contented with with what i was doing for my corporate career and it's not that i hated it 
but it was comfortable. It was a, a six out of 10. And that was actually part of the problem is like, it, it, it got in the way of everything meaningful in my life, my health, my relationships. I wasn't writing like I wanted to write. I wasn't creating how I wanted to create. I certainly wasn't contributing in a meaningful way, but I was making a good income. I had a nice house. I had several Lexuses. And I realized like... <laughs> Is it Lexuses or Lexi? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Sean's not here to look it up for us. <laughs> um, but, uh, and so you, you, get, you get to this point where you are are comfortable and you're afraid to lose that comfort mm. and minimalism was a way for me to realize that that comfort was a bit of a facade and, and, and I, comfort was getting in the way of what i consider to be meaningful about your transition out of the the corporate world mm -hmm. what was that decision like for you and, and it, i think back to when i started as a freelancer and it sounds similar to you guys where you say you had 50 followers come to your site, 50 people come to your site to read what you had to say. Right. Um, I had a hundred dollar project every once in a while, every two weeks, not <laughs> enough, right? 50 people is likely not enough. No. Um, if you're trying to, to spread your message message and make a sustainable well, living. I, yeah. To make it sustain. Yeah. To, to, uh, to have people to support you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I so mean, again, there, we never had a number, in our heads on like how many people I mean, in fact if you were to ask me now like so what's the number to have a sustainable audience uh that can support uh, support you on a consistent basis like i wouldn't even be able to tell you um yeah, and it's probably different for everyone because for yeah. some people with that 50 if you're a, mm -hmm. a really well-known artist and you have 50 really good buyers you might be a multimillionaire. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Very and, true. Or if, uh, you know, Kevin Kelly says, you know, a thousand true fans or whatever. I, I think, Ryan, early on, you and I, we weren't, it wasn't a business, though. Like, it literally, oh. it legitimately wasn't a business. Like, we we had a domain, but we didn't have, you know, the LLC or mm -hmm. any hopes to have, like, uh, a team of people that we work with. And, and that's why Ryan earlier was talking about Sean. Like, is our employee? Like, we don't think of people in t those terms. Like, we're all on the same team, right? And 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 I think that early on, it was just like, wow, this is pretty cool. Like, some people are getting something from this. And then we learned, like, hey, maybe we can make some money. Yeah, well, we didn't. I mean, we didn't. We didn't charge for anything on our website for the first year that we had it. I mean, it was just us putting up our essays. And it wasn't until, yeah, people kept asking, when are you going to come out with your book? And I'm like, well. Yeah, that makes sense. And Josh is like, "Yeah, we're the minimalists. We should write a book on on minimalism." So, I mean, that was really the first thing we charged for. That book we wrote in, I think it came out December two thousand eleven. Is That's that correct? correct? Yeah. Um, the best sales month that it ever had. It was December two thousand twelve. Thirteen. Thirteen. Sorry, so it was two years later. Yeah. Hmm. And that, and so, you know, j just to the point of like, there is no, there is no magic recipe, I guess. How do you approach risk? Because it seems to me that that's a huge risk. You have these jobs where you're comfortable, oh. where you're making a lot of money. and Back to you the guys... transition question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so how do you deal with that risk? When I sat Josh down and asked him, why the hell are you so happy? And he told me about this thing called minimalism and introduced me to an entire community of people who were minimalists. What I saw was some very common sense things. Like, oh, if I don't have a six-figure mortgage hanging over my head, if I don't buy a new car every couple of years, if I stop racking up all this credit card debt, maybe I won't have to work 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week. So for me, minimalism, the, the why behind it, it was, you know, why did I want to uh, become a minimalist? Uh, when I asked myself that question, how might my life be better with less? Like the one thing that really stood out to me was, was my time. I could, I could reclaim some of my time. So minimalism, I, I wasn't like diving into it to be this, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to live in a box from now. I'm going to be a freegan and I'm going to go live in a box and, uh, you know, live, li live with as little money as possible. I mean, it, it wasn't about doing it for the sake of, look at me, look how, uh, you know, altruistic I am. Like here, here I am giving up everything. It was more about... Hey, look, here is what I have on my plate now. And if I could find a way to give this up, then I can reclaim some of my time and, and maybe start on a better path. So it took me about, I want to say about a year, year and a half of 
of paying off debt, um, of budgeting, eating ramen noodles and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, which I really wish I would have done something different back then. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the healthiest diet, but it was cheap. Um, better than carrot juice. Better than carrot juice. <laughs> Guys, I, I'm pretty sure that this is going to be a big fad now. The yeah. carrot juice carrot is juice. going to take over, yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, it, we didn't just quit our jobs and start a blog. That's the worst advice anyone can give you. Um, it was a very slow transition. In fact, I got laid off. It wasn't even like I didn't really have the choice to be like, okay, now I have all my ducks in a row. Um, I'm going to go ahead and quit now. It, it, I'm actually grateful I got laid off because I don't know if I ever would have got to that point where... I would have actually walked away. I mean, probably yeah. would have, but it would have been much later than when I got laid off in September 2012. Is that right? Yeah. 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 It sounds like it's it's about calculated risk. So everybody should take risks and you're going to have to take risks in life if you're going to do anything worth doing. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's anything wrong with risk as long as you're making, like you said, a calculated risk. So when I got laid off, thank God that I had been going down this minimalist path because at that point, I did have uh, six months worth of bills saved up. Um, I had paid off a lot of my debt. I got rid of my car payment. Um, I, I had prepared because eventually the plan was to quit. You moved but, out of your big house and, yeah. and rented it out mm-hmm. to someone because you couldn't sell it. Exactly. So it's so uh, when when I got laid off, um, yeah. I mean, it, it. I guess that wasn't really taking a risk because I got laid off. <laughs> Risk is kind of risk is what you can stomach, though, right? It's like everybody has a different threshold of yeah. what they can stomach. I will, I will tell you though that like w- the month before I got laid off, I went to my boss and I, because I had got to a point where I felt like okay, if I got late, if I lost my job tomorrow, I can survive for at least the next six months and try and figure out some things to do. So I went to my boss uh, the month before I got laid off and I asked and I asked him like, hey man, if I ever decide to leave. Um, who, who would you fill my role with? Who, who, who would you replace me with? And we were talking and eventually he's like, you know what, man? He's like, this, this program is working really well. I don't know if I would, if I would replace you. And I'm like, huh, that's a really interesting thought, isn't it? And then a month later, you know, I get the text of, Hey Ryan, meet me in this conference room where we've laid off dozens of people before. (laughs) So, I mean, you know, when I got the text, I knew what was coming. But yeah, I mean, they basically hired, you know, hired me to build a program in the company. I did that. It was, it was running well. They didn't need my role anymore. Um, but I would not have had that conversation with him if I didn't already, if I hadn't been working a plan for the last year and a half. So I think that's where risk is okay to take. Like as long as you have a plan behind it and it is a bit calculated, um, what I've learned in my life is that I'm never going to just fall completely flat on my face as long as I, I do the, the pre-work before taking that risk. I think some risks are, are really dangerous. The problem is we, we, think, we think most things that are risks, are, we, we treat most things like, oh my God, my 401k uh, slipped by one-tenth of one percent this month. Like We have the same reaction to that. Oh my God, like, so as we do, you know, uh, I was... Last night we saw a coyote walking around. Like that is a much bigger risk to me than my my 401k. If that thing is rabid and decides to attack me, I have to tri- trip Bex and run faster than her. <laughs> Thank plan, God Bex plan plan karate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> coyote karate. <laughs> coyote karate. <laughs> no, I I think that um uh, th- that's the problem with with risk is we are, we're often treating it like like um it's something is dangerous. And for me, it was riskier to stay because I saw what the outcome was when I, those guys I aspired to be like, that's real risk that, uh, uh, going down that route, you know, being fat, overweight and, and, uh, just unhealthy in general, but also being unhappy. That's, that's pretty risky too. being dissatisfied with the life you're living. Like how long are you going to, how long are you going to do that before it's, you, you start to look back and regret the life that you lived. And I could see that right then. Like I don't regret spending all that time in my twenties learning what I learned. And, and that was, i learned a whole lot that I was able to tweeze out and pull forward. But I know if I would have continued down that path much longer, um, I, I wouldn't have been living the life that I wanted to live. And it's not a perfect life. I still feel stress and anxiety and, and, and there are times where it's really difficult. In fact, there are times it's so difficult where I'm like, man, it'd be easier to just go back and work for someone. <laughs> I don't have to make all the damn decisions. Um, and, and the truth is that 
when you look at the aggregate, it's so much better. And it's actually less risky now um, than what it was before. And by the way, like staying with where I was ultimately would have been the, the biggest risk because they were acquired by another company, uh, by, by a larger telecom company that ate them up. And, and, and then, you know, very likely I would have been gone in that transition back in 2014 or whatever. And then if I wouldn't have prepared for it, you know, I, I would have been scrambling to try to find a similar telecom job in Providence, Rhode Island or something. Like just trying to like find whatever I can get to pay the bills uh, uh, because I was still attached to that lifestyle. Man, that's a real risk. Mm. It seems like the the smartest thing that you can do is to develop and learn skills that aren't going out of style anytime soon. So if you develop becoming a better writer or if you learn how to become a filmmaker or a photographer, these are all things that aren't going to go away mm -hmm. very soon. Right. Um, and it's something that if you can build something on your own and learn how to pick up some freelance jobs, even if the economy is doing bad, even if there aren't many jobs, you can probably still pick up some work. When you press record for the first time on a camera, you it's not you're like, well, I'm getting paid to do this. Um, it, it had to do with something you were interested in, something that maybe aligned with what you wanted to do in the future, but, but it wasn't about money first. And, and I think a lot of these things for, for them to, to work out well for us long term is you want to be able to do it even if it's not sustainable monetarily. But then you can also look to see, does anyone make money doing this? Is there anyone who makes money as a filmmaker? Is there anyone who makes money as a writer? And the answer is, of course, yes. And, and I mean, you can find someone who is, you know, a, a clown who, I mean, literally dresses up like clowns and, and makes money. If that's what you're passionate about, then great. Uh, if you're passionate about teaching horse, horseback riding, you can find a way to make a living from that, from, from that passion, or at least somewhere that's adjacent to that passion. For me, it was a J like I wrote fiction. That was the thing I, I always wanted to do. And now I write a lot less fiction because we had this whole beautiful nonfiction route. It was adjacent to what I was already doing. And, and for you, I mean, you started out, you were doing wedding videography. Bar mitzvah. I was, dude, I was just looking at some of the old bar mitzvah intro videos I made. I saw that with the bat on fire. Wasn't that like incredible? <laughs> That's so awesome. Good. I'm like, but you know what? Actually, I, I learned and, and relearned <laughs> about how I approached those projects back in the day is that was a bar mitzvah video. There weren't high expectations, but like I used it as an opportunity to practice color grading, yeah. to learn after effects and how to track fire onto a baseball bat. Like uh -huh. I was like, holy cow, I probably learned a lot from that project. Um, but you, you can't just say, oh, it's, this is just something that's temporary. I feel like any time you're developing your skill and your craft, you have to put yourself into it. Yeah. I think we all, we all, we're all born with some sort of talents, but, but we often, uh, mistake those talents for skills. Like a skill is actually developed and you have to spend time. So, so you might have a natural eye to see lighting or, or the, the, the way that, that, uh, you focus a camera or the way that you, you are filming a particular scene you might have a natural eye for that, but what makes it beautiful is the skill of, of figuring out how to do it most effectively. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same with with anything else, any other creative endeavor, and not even creative endeavors. Like being in the business world, like I learned how to, to run a business not by going to some class and reading about business theory, but by opening dozens of retail stores and managing hundreds of employees over many years. I messed up a lot. I had mentors on my own, but it was on the job training it was much more effective than just going to a class and, and, uh, trying to sort of learn via osmosis or just, you can't just read what's on your page here. And then all of a sudden say, well, now I know how to direct a film. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. And it's the same with writing a book. It's the same with, with pretty much any endeavor, creative or not. Yeah, there are only so many entrepreneurial books you can read before you have to just put them down and actually try to start a business. Yeah. And you can get some good sort of best practices from those, but you still have to implement that in your everyday life. Otherwise, it's useless. Yeah, I think it's like you get the, the guiding wisdom and, and good mentoring from that. So sure. say if you don't have mentors in your life that can guide you in the right way and say, hey, it's just it's not always about the bottom line it's very easy to get caught up in the rat race of the nine to five corporate world, but there is still a rat race beyond that in the entrepreneurial world and, and somebody running their own business because it can very quickly become about likes, about uh, how many followers you have, about how big your audience is, how well we did this quarter compared to next quarter. 
how did you guys from the onset make sure you didn't fall back into that trap? <laughs> my, my number one secret is I spend less money than what I make. <laughs> so like Josh and I are never comparing last quarter versus this quarter or last year versus this year. I mean, we, we have an idea cause you know, we do our taxes, but we don't ever sit down and we're like, Oh man, you know, we made 10,000 bucks less this year. How can we, how can we make that Delta back up this year? Yeah. Um, push more books. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's funny, Jessica came to, so Jessica, uh, Jessica Lynn Williams, she runs our, our social media. Uh, we're really fortunate enough to, to have her. She curates everything. So we, we still interact on social media, but she curates a lot of the posts and, and stuff that we have. We also bring her on the road to, to share some of our pithy answers when we're doing live podcasts on stage. She live tweets and stuff. And, and she came to me uh, early on uh, in the tour this year and said, you know, you guys have just never asked me like about engagement and clicks and likes. She's like, how am I supposed to know if I'm doing well? And I'm like, are you doing well? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, but I think I can improve this. I can improve this and this. I said, okay, but none of those things have to do with likes. How much of a influence you have has very little to do with the counts. It's one of the nice things about Netflix. We went to go meet with Netflix a few months ago and they're like, and you know, secretly we'd love to know how many people saw the film because you know it's in the tens of millions at this point just based on on the amount of traffic that that has cascaded our way um but you'd love to know like how how's the film doing what other like you want to get the stats on it right um because mainly because they don't share it with you in fact the lady said we don't even share the the numbers with kevin spacey mm -hmm. you think we're going to share it with you <laughs> and uh that was a good point but yeah. but in a weird way that was freeing and and because we actually run the rest of our business if you want to call it that the same way um we'll look at our traffic stats once a year um to give to our publicists so they can say well if they're if they're reaching out to someone here's the, what they get but i'm not looking at the numbers the downloads all this other stuff because y you you start to let that influence the way that you are are creating if i could just have a more creative thumbnail and, and for this video or if i could just have a better title for this and that's why you see all these vapid clickbaity listicles or or you must do this, the secret to this, the 67 ways to blank. And you're like, it, does anyone really walk away from that feeling like, like they were, they're a better person after reading it? Or do they just feel like, oh shit, I, I just wasted the last 90 seconds? I'm a numbers guy. I love numbers. Um, I probably look at the numbers more than Josh. But for me... Um, it's, it's numbers are fun. So that's one mm -hmm. thing I, I, I like, I like looking at them. I mean, I partly play fantasy football because I love the numbers, man. I love researching and, and doing all the calculations and figuring out who I should start and, you know, so forth and so on. Um, but those numbers are not the driver. Like it is, if anything, it might be an indicator. So, you know, it might be, um, you know, if I, if I look at a, if I look at a, uh, a dip in traffic and, you know, Josh and I hadn't put an essay out in, you know, in a week or, or two, which I don't think we've ever gone two weeks without putting out an essay. Um, but, but that is an indicator, right? Oh, okay, great. Like, yeah, people aren't just coming back to our site. Like they do want some fresh content. Mm -hmm. um, but again, like that's, to me, it's, it's like, it's like when I feel stress, um, I don't just like sit there and react to the stress. It's more like, what is this, what is this telling me? is it telling me anything or like, what do, what do I need to focus on? So like, I'll look at numbers that way, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you, man, like, you know, when I've got to 10,000 Twitter followers versus 30,000 Twitter followers, it, it doesn't feel any different. It wasn't the key to happiness. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Damn, you didn't find it. It's 50,000 Twitter followers. <laughs> I, I remember, uh, Josh, we had a conversation early on. I was asking you for advice. It was around the same time we were talking about what to name my podcast. And I was like, by the way, for those of you who listen to this on the minimalist podcast, feed, it's called the ground up show. Uh, you can find it on Apple podcasts or wherever, and you should check it out if you enjoy podcasts because it is a good podcast. So there's, there's the plug for that. Thank you, sir. Appreciate yeah, that. And, 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 and also <laughs> video. If you want to see me and Ryan, this is all on video right now as well. 
Uh, we'll probably put this up on our YouTube page as well. But he has a whole Matt. Matt has a whole YouTube page with all that stuff. So uh, yeah, ground up show. You can find it. Yeah. So we had this early conversation, and I was just trying to pick your brain, get some advice about how what can I do because this is really a time when I was starting to make original content for the first time. We just put out minimalism, and this was. I did freelance film work for a very long time. I loved it. It was great. But minimalism was a chance for me to to get something, put something out that I really cared about. Right. Like, this was at the top of my bucket list. Make a document. Like literally four months before we started the documentary, before Josh emailed me about it, it was on my bucket list. I wrote, make a documentary about something I care about, mm. something I'm passionate about. And then that email comes in. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> like Josh the hacked into my emails. <laughs> the secret. The secret. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Wait, hold on real quick. So, so that, that goes to the thing Ryan was talking about earlier with, with uh, high standards and low expectations. Because we went into making that documentary with high standards. And we all had, um, let's say, heavy opinions about the direction and where we wanted it to go. We went back and forth. And the final version that ended up in theaters and on, and on Netflix was like the ninth version uh, and it had gone through a bunch of iterations there was a dip there in the middle with the, the Fargo incident <laughs> the Fargo we don't need to go into the Fargo incident yeah yeah that was uh, we thought that Matt just just to recap real quick we thought Matt was like uh, punking us like it was an early April Fool's joke or something yeah. um, but uh, yeah he sent us a cut of the documentary that actually ended up shaping the direction of the documentary to be much better yeah but what he sent us was terrifyingly bad. It was avant-garde. It was just, <laughs> no, it was it was just very straightforward. I'm an artist. It was, it was mostly interviews. Yeah, it was. I saw what you were trying to do with it, man. I, um, I, so I totally respect where you're going. But yeah, but yeah, but, we could but talking talk about that process, how many times did uh, you, Josh, and I like? How often did we talk about where the documentary was going as far as distribution? And what our expectations were for, for we that. We literally, like, it was in the very beginning, we might have said, oh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll probably just release it through Vimeo, put it, like, say, give it to our audience, and yeah. um, maybe we'll, we'll find an YouTube, audience for it. Like, yeah. We didn't have a specific expectation is really the point. Well, but there was no document floating around that was like, we need to get into movie theaters, we need to get with Netflix, we yeah. need to, I mean, and film we were, festivals. Film festivals. And we were putting money into it, too. Sure. So, but, like, we didn't, honestly, it was like, yeah, if we make our money back, that'd be cool. Right. But I don't care. I was like, I just want to make this movie. I just want to put it out there. Um, this is a chance for me to actually direct a feature length documentary. It was more about climbing the mountain than it was about, um, you know, trying to make money or trying to reach a certain amount of people. Well, right. well continue, continue that, that metaphor. It was more about climbing the mountain than reaching the summit. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I think that it was about enjoying the climb because going through it and it, it took the better part of three years from the very first frame to, being out on on Netflix, uh, it was quite the journey, and and that whole time it wasn't because if we would have had the expectations like, well, we want to be in the Toronto Film Festival and this and this and like we did submit to a bunch of film festivals and learned that that is a total racket and a waste of money, um, and we had this great film that didn't get accepted by a lot of film festivals, but it got accepted by the most important. Uh, 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 type of acceptance which is having an actual audience who mm -hmm. enjoys it and finds that film transformative and we didn't it wasn't our expectation to get it on the Netflix it, it was our high standards that ended up getting it on there in the long run in fact they even said no to the documentary a couple times uh, and we had to go through you know sort of third party and, and work that out um, but it, it it wasn't like well this is a failure if it doesn't if X, Y, and Z ha doesn't happen, no, it's a success as long as your standards are mm -hmm. high. Yeah. And I think it's, yeah, get ready for a lot of no's because we, like you said, we got rejected from a lot of film festivals. Good a group. lot of people we asked that we wanted to interview in the film said, no, who are you guys? Right. Uh, a lot of, like you said, Netflix said no in the beginning. Um, you can't let those stop you from, from moving forward. Uh, no. So we put out minimalism and this is, you know, my first time putting an original work out there. And I was like, this is cool. Like, I want to keep doing this. Like, this is a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so that's why I started the podcast. And also I had a lot of filmmakers asking me for advice about 
um, how we put it together. And I think a lot of people had this expectation that it's a Netflix documentary. There was 20 people in the background orchestrating everything. Everything was like, um, no, it was Matt with that camera right there. (laughs) Legitimately. (laughs) Actually, it wasn't even the camera as nice as that camera. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was just running around with a camera and like a, a a lighting kit that filled up about half of the car. We got a photo actually when I left on tour with you guys, Uh with you, uh, (laughs) posing next to the the lighting kit. Um, I still miss that lighting kit. Yeah. <laughs> the lighting kit. Yeah, I had to let it go. Best lighting kit ever. Uh, so it was, you know, I was like, all right, how do, how do I do this, Josh? Like, what, what are some pointers and advice? Like, I know I need to make consistent content. That's like number one. I just got to keep putting content out there. Oh. And then you just stop me. You're like, Matt, 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 just, just wait a minute. Like, you have to make meaningful content. It's right. not about the amount of content you put out there. Uh, being consistent is important, but you have to consistently make meaningful content yeah and in fact I, I i try to stop using that word altogether because for me it has a negative connotation now uh, i realize it doesn't have to have a negative connotation but for me in my mind it does because I, it's it's so just trite when i hear like yeah it's really about you know, got to put more content out there and 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 that's the internet culture we're in like putting more content and i try to eschew content at, uh, and, and instead produce meaningful creations. And so to me, it's about producing meaningful creations, not content creation. And I think if you can delineate the two, the question is, well, what is meaningful to you? And it doesn't mean it's going to be meaningful for everyone. You're still going to get one star reviews and thumbs down or whatever else. And, and that just means that someone else was like, hey, this wasn't for me. And that's okay. In fact, we have an essay on our website called This Probably Isn't For You. And when someone, whenever someone leaves like a, a terrible comment or whatever, Jessica will just send them the link to that essay. This probably isn't for you. And that's okay. And realizing that is really freeing because you realize you're not making something for everyone. It's not vanilla ice cream. You want, you want something with your own flavor to it. And not everyone is going to enjoy the taste of what you're making. And I think that's okay. But if you find it meaningful, there's a good chance that other people will. Because there's a lot of other people who are a lot like you. Not, not demographically like you, but like-minded and, and open-minded and, and are asking some of the same questions that you're asking. And if you can produce something meaningful instead of just trying to produce something for the sake of produ- producing something. Because, well, it is another Wednesday and I have to put out another vlog today. Uh, or it's everyday vlog thing. I thought, and, and to me, so, there are some people who can do that really well. They can do a daily vlog and it's really good the vast majority of the time. Just like Seth Godin can write a blog post every day. And he is, uh, we were at a conference once and uh, a gal there, uh, Amanda, I think her name was, uh, up at Misfit, she, she was talking about how she interned for Seth Godin for mm. a while. And she said, and it was like the best moment of my life because... Seth Godin is my Beyonce. <laughs> and I'm like, I kind of feel that way too. Like, like in terms of blogging, like not writing in general, there are p- people that are much better writers than Seth Godin. Um, there is, I can't name another person who's even as good, close to being as good at blogging as Seth Godin. And he's able to do it every day. And, and here's the key. It's meaningful. What he produces are meaningful creations. He's not posting every day for the sake of content creation and i think if, if he ever got there he'd walk away from it how do you how do you keep up that consistency and how do you consistently be good like that seems to be really challenging to create um you know a lot of his stuff will have some overlap same with you guys you're talking about simple living there's only so much that you can touch on how do you can continue to make consistently meaningful and good quality essays that's kind of the answer to the question. Like you have to consistently write because you're actually consistently getting better when you, when you put forth the effort. Yeah. So it's not even consistently good. It's consistently getting better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's a good point, man. I I feel that, that, you know, like even with the podcast, there are some episodes very recently, uh, back in the mid nineties, we, we did, uh, mid nineties as in our, we're on our hundredth episode. So I was going to say, I was like, you guys are ahead of we've, the game. We've been podcasting <laughs> since the mid nineties. <laughs> that would have been great if we would have started this podcast in high school. Oh man. Oh. Oh. We're still running 20 something years. Yeah. Wait, has it been 20 years since? Oh. Man. Yeah. All you high school kids out there, start a podcast and keep it going for 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And in fact, we were at the Academy of Podcasters convention recently. Ryan is now an Academy nominated Academy Award nominee. Academy um, Award. Is that? I'd like to yeah, thank Academy. the Academy for their nomination. <laughs> yeah, we, we uh, our podcast got not. We we lost the the award. Oh, dude, we were being at, nominated is winning, Josh. Yeah, <laughs> dude, yeah, but we were on the list with like Dan Savage, 
and yeah uh, just prolific yeah dr podcasters. drew yeah like i'm like i don't even know how we ended up on that list we but. joined fellow losers like joe rogan and, right and tim ferris <laughs> yes. and, sam, and sam harris yeah anyway anyway Crazy. um I, I find that um consistently do it but also being will okay, so here's here's a better answer for you being willing to throw away a lot and remember especially early on for every initially probably every five podcasts we recorded we, we published one and over time it was three and then it was like two. And now, even now, it's like we recorded a podcast in Philadelphia recently. And I don't know that if that one will ever see the light of day. Or maybe our Patreon supporters will get to <laughs> hear it. Uh, we'll put it out eventually later. But uh, it wasn't something that I walked out of there happy with at all. And that was happening a lot early on, especially with the writing. So uh, we've published three books together. I published one novel. That novel was 900 pages at its bloated zenith and 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 it's 200 pages now and the point was there's a whole lot that has to hit the cutting room floor and you you showed this with the documentary man can you imagine so i would imagine you have 2000 hours of footage from all everything that we did again most of it being sunsets in santa fe <laughs> new mexico yeah it's and, uh, and messed up sunsets <laughs> yeah, i'll uh, never forget those sunsets we watched together man. yeah it yeah it was so beautiful romantic. it was an experience um <laughs> anyway um if you had two, if you just published all two thousand hours, it would be the worst documentary of all time. <laughs> that's that's the Fargo cut. <laughs> it makes me think of uh, the um, exit through the gift shop, the f- yeah. <laughs> the first cut of the documentary that that dude made for Banksy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> anyway, that was so that, that's so it was so bad it was good. Right. Yeah. It was in the context of one of the best documentaries of all time, Exit Through the Gift Shop, mm-hmm. um, and, and I feel that. It's the same thing with anything we do. People see the end product and they're like, how hard could it be to make a 79 minute documentary? It's not a 79 minute documentary initially. It's thousands of hours of footage and you have to figure out the right bits to curate. And I think it's the same with anything else that you're doing. Now, different mediums lend themselves to different types of communication. With our podcast, we don't, you're not going to do for 79 minute interview, you're not going to do 2000 hours of interviewing. Um, but it, it may mean that you throw away some podcasts that just didn't work out. You re-record them. That's what Ryan and I, quite often early on, because most of our podcasts are about a particular topic. So we have a topic, budgeting. We'd sit there and record a two-hour podcast, and we'd look at each other afterwards like, that was crap, wasn't it? Yeah, I didn't like it. <laughs> All right, see you tomorrow. We'll, we'll, we'll come back and answer the same exact questions again, mm. and hopefully it'll be better tomorrow. And if it's not, we'll do it again. Or maybe we'll just set it aside. I have a list of maybe 200 essays that I've started and are in some various stage of completion that may never get completed, or they, they, they may get completed someday. There might be an idea that was great seven years ago. In fact, I was talking to uh, Andrew Bell about this. We just had Andrew Bell on our podcast. He's like our favorite musician. Uh, he was on our Indianapolis podcast, which was truly great. He performed a live song on there. And his new new album, it took four years to put together. And he said the first song that, that the first song he wrote for it, he wrote seven years ago and he just couldn't find a way to make it work until the last year. Mm. And when you ask him how many how many uh, how many songs did not make the record, there's only ten songs or there's eleven songs in this album. It's his longest album. Eleven songs on it and, and He's like nothing. Everything from my last four years is is here, but it took me it, it took me sometimes seven years to get the song right. So the way he does it is he'll put as many years into something as he needs to make it right. Not perfect, but make it the best given the circumstances and the resources that he has. I was just noticing this as I was working on this project, this video we're working on right now, and I'm watching it back and. It, always the first cut's going to be a little bit longer. It's going to be have some extra stuff, but you don't realize it. Even if you do 10 passes through, you don't realize all the extra stuff that you don't need in it, how you could shape it down. And I was kind of, a lot of it's based on your gut, right? And your intuition, where if you're looking at a, a page and you're reading through it, you're like, mm, that kind of, that part doesn't really feel right. It doesn't mm. sound right. And then I, what, is, what is it about the process, the creative process, where you start to figure out what's working and what's not. I teach a writing class. And one of the things I have to communicate with students is you are simultaneously more interesting and less interesting than you think. And I think it's a problem. We, we have this fear in our lives. Like it, you're, it, the, the video you're talking about the trailer for we're doing this physical, our first physical good we've ever, we've ever done. Right. And uh, it's a, it's a bag. And, and what, 
what you're going through there when you have that four minute seven minute video that you're starting to whittle down is we get so married to a particular scene or particular line and we say i can't i can't divorce myself from that and and who is it fitzgerald who said kill your darlings with respect to writing and and i think quite often we have to be willing to let go of anything that doesn't really move it forward and make it better and and Part of that has to do with emotional detachment from from the creation that that and that comes during the editing process. You want to have plenty of emotional attachment up front to to make that thing as interesting as possible, but then to call it down to what its essence is to make it the most beautiful. Brevity is the soul of wit. To get down to that, you kind of have to remove yourself from it and say, "I'm willing to delete anything from this." Uh, one of the tips that that I, I teach writing students is. One of the things you want to do is delete your first two paragraphs and anything you write, see if it makes it better. And quite often it does because we, we have too much throat clearing at the beginning of our writing and that will happen with any creative endeavor. Mm, that's a really good point. Yeah, I'm thinking like two of my most favorite books is uh, one of them is The Flinch. Um, yeah, Julian Smith. By, yeah, by Julian Smith. It's an awesome book. What, what is that, like 80 something pages? I think it's 30 pages. Yeah, I read it in a day. Yeah. Did you take the cold shower in it? Yeah, yeah, me yeah, too. That's great. Yeah, but but like that was one. Of, that was a very impactful impactful book. I me. read it in a cold shower. Um, <laughs> You're like one step ahead of you, Julian. Josh has always got a one up everyone. <laughs> yeah, and then the other one is uh oh no, it's it's uh everything you want or anything you want. Anything Derek Sivers. Yeah, by Sivers. Yeah, yeah. and like that one is it, like every line is tweetable. Yeah, eighty eight pages, man. Yeah, it's it, it's it, it's a weird thing because I agree that in terms of like sort of nonfiction books that's certainly one of my favorite because it's it's like full of these little zen maxims almost so that that like you said they're all sort of tweetable right and then there are other people like david foster wallace you know probably the most impressive book i've ever read and it's just impressive by the fact that you can if you read a book like this but then you think about the guy writing it, it is infinite jest and it's it's 1100 pages is like nine point font it's super dense paragraphs and sentences go on for pages um and every sentence is beautiful it looks like every sentence is sculpted and when you realize that he wrote the book within in three years how how and he was younger than we are now oh he's older than you are matt you're still in your 20s for oh, baby yeah, that's right <laughs> i'm 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 not exactly knocking on 40s door yet but i'm i'm walking down the path toward toward the screen door at least <laughs> we have no choice josh <laughs> no anyway um <laughs> you you read something like that and you realize like what is possible and, and and it's possible to also challenge the audience so so reading books like whether it's a flinch or infinite jest and, and realizing like oh there is something else that's possible i'm not i'm not capable to, uh, of doing that but what can i get from it and what i learned from a book like infinite jest is there's a great payoff at the end but you have to literally read all 1100 pages and it takes six months to read this book but but it, you can require hard work of your audience and if if you do so in a in the flinch is the same way julian smith is a guy who will shake the hell out of you and you'll thank him afterward for shaking you most people come up to me and shake me i want to fight them but but julian for some some somehow he, he's able to approach it you're like wow i needed that thanks and, and so sometimes it's about challenging the audience uh rob bell says you want to stay one half step ahead of the audience. You don't want to be a step or two ahead because then you're too far and your ideas are way too out there. But if you're half step ahead of someone, it allows them to want to follow and, and catch up. There's something beautiful about being inspired by somebody like, say, David Foster Wallace, where you, you look at that book and you're like, oh man, like I need to step my game up. I need yeah. to step my shit up. But then there's also people that I would see that I'm like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And that's kind of why I started the podcast. I was like, I could do this. Other people are <laughs> doing it. You saw our podcast, like, <laughs> yeah. they could do I it. Could do I this. could do it. Yeah. I think you need to be uh, motivated in both ways um, to see what's possible and also to push yourself where you didn't think you could go. Yeah, I, I tend not to compare myself with others just because I will, you know, find the people who I really look up to and it makes me feel like I have to step my game up and then, you know, it'll like make me force something that I should not have forced. Um, right. But yeah, I, but it is good to know where you're at. I mean, just as far as talent and, you know, honestly, uh, that whole community of people of minimalists that Josh inter introduced me to, like they've been hu huge inspiration for, uh, you know, the last seven years. So you certainly do need to like, read other people's work and you know if you're a filmmaker then 
you should watch a lot of movies and and see what styles you like and and look at other people's recipes and see if there's any ingredients that you can apply to yourself. We were talking about this a couple of days ago about self-reliance and how it's it's changed over time and how self-reliance used to be starting a fire, building a shelter and uh, maybe being able to fix your car or change a light bulb. And uh, today it's it's changed pretty dramatically, especially in our digital age. It's it can be about growing an audience about having a creating a brand which would be almost like presenting yourself online how do people perceive you Mm -hmm. um i'm curious so i i want to try to help and give people advice that are really starting out on this like say somebody starting out with zero followers or they don't have any presence online and they want to be able to put themselves out there Mm -hmm. imagine you guys like there was some crazy incident. Somebody hacked into all your files, your website it crashed, and then somebody went through like your computers and burned them, and then all your hard drives were destroyed, and you got this, the minimalists were gone. This sort of happened recently. Yeah. Thankfully, <laughs> Jeff was around. We so we had a, a malicious attack on our website, and someone deleted everything. This is actually the first time we've talked about it publicly. Yeah. I think. Yeah, it was it was terrifying, but like, <laughs> man, like I went to the tour page. I'm like. Why does it look like the tour page is deleted? Yeah, and, and then wow. it looked like everything was deleted, and someone went in and deleted everything. Every, and, like, yeah, it was crazy. holy cow! And um, like we just thought it was gone. Like, and and um, thankfully Jeff, who, who's our very talented web developer over at Spire, he was able to recover and work for several days straight to to fix everything. And man, it was so. Shout out to, to Spire Media yeah. for, for what they do. It was like do. the day. Um, we had some kind of tickets go on sale for... It was like the first leg of our tour. <laughs> yeah, it was like we had just announced, yeah, our, our tour. And yeah, so we were like, hey, hey, go to lessonsnow.com. It was just forwards to our tour page, basically, at The Minimalists. And people go there, and it was just <laughs> like nothing. There's nothing there. Yeah. And, and It was like and, the worst possible time for it to happen. Man, I'll tell you, I'm so grateful for going there. Because I've had a lot of this just shitty stuff happen over the last few years, and it's allowed me to deal with those things a lot better and it could all blow up tomorrow and know that I, I know that I'd be completely fine and I wouldn't even have the same reaction I would have had seven years ago where I'd be throwing stuff across the room and I mean I'll still get angry but I think it'll be appropriate it'll be appropriate response you know I, I'm not going to be the psychopath who just who who has no emotional reaction to it but it's a more sort of tempered um uh, reaction to to the the negative news, but what I would tell someone who's just starting out is zero followers. You're starting the same place I did. You're starting the same place everyone else does as well, and, and it gets man. I know early on, especially that first year, you get really caught up and oh my god, I got to a thousand Twitter followers or a hundred thousand Instagram or whatever, and. It doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. Ryan said it earlier, like 10,000 followers isn't going to make you happy. Those metrics mean very little um, if, if you're not creating what you want to create. Because here's the thing. What if, what if you did get to a million followers, but you were doing something that was awful? Like you, you just didn't enjoy doing. Now, now you're in a different kind of trap. You walked away from one. You got out of one cage and you walked into another cage. And... And, and even if it's a prettier cage it's and you enjoy the cage a little bit more, it's still a cage. And, and if you're trapped by what your, your, the size of your audience is, I mean, Freud would have a lot to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, dude, I completely agree with you on all fronts. Um, what's difficult and challenging as, as a creator is that when you, you build an audience, and obviously like I don't think – just looking at the numbers, like we said, is an unhealthy thing to do, and it's not. Um, it shouldn't be the end goal. Period. I don't. Yeah. But I having, mean, but also, but having an an audience and having, say, ten thousand, twenty thousand Twitter followers, whatever it is, in a way, it is clout. And and so, if I could develop a bigger audience, I could get uh, bigger guests on my show. I could get interesting people on my show. It wouldn't be as challenging to find new guests. So there are doors that open when sure. you do have a following. And I think that's what's tough is that 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 balancing act between not caring about how many followers you have because you really want to focus on what you want to make and and you're doing it because you really love it. Mm -hmm. Um, And also knowing that it will be and could be beneficial to grow this audience and to also impact more people and and change lives. Yeah, if you've got a million Twitter followers and you go to, you know, someone and say, hey, do you want to be on my podcast? Yes, like they're more more likely to look at your followers and be like, oh, you've got a million Twitter followers. True. 
I uh, would love to be introduced to your audience. So yeah, I think that is certainly, um, certainly true where it does open doors. But like you said, it is, I don't think it's necessarily unhealthy to look at numbers, but it can certainly be unhealthy to look at those numbers. Because if you start working for the numbers, well, you're not working for yourself anymore. Mm-hmm. And that is a really, uh, it's a really fast way to kill any, but any passion. I feel like a lot of times you, you try to think about the big picture and where you want to go with something. But at the end of the day, it's just you on the desk writing or editing or making that video or, or producing what you really enjoy. So it's like, yeah, you can look at that and you can stress out about it if you want, but you looking at it and paying attention to it and say, if it's a problem that you don't have a lot of followers, mm-hmm. it's actually not going to help anything. No. Right? Well, and, and, and so, so. If you were to take a photo uh, of a rainbow in black and white, it, that's kind of like looking at the number. If that's all you do is look at the numbers and that, that's how, how you ste- steer, it's like trying to look at a rainbow in grayscale. Like you're missing out on all the other things that make, make the creation beautiful. And you're right. It, it may be easier. You know, Ryan was saying if you have a million Twitter followers, you can get an interview with, you know, you might be able to get the rock. I was actually gonna bring that up. Who's there? He's, this is he's a, on the, I don't know if the cameras can see. Oh, it can this, t- yeah, look, it could totally see it. It's the rock right, right is, there in the corner. Oh, yeah. It's, great. it's like been right, right above Ryan's right, shoulder. Yeah, right there. <laughs> so Matt really wants to get the rock on his podcast. So here's the thing: I don't know if he had a million Twitter followers. That would even matter to him at all. And so, so here, and it may even turn him away. Uh, it may it may turn him off from like, ah, oh, it's another big podcast. Who cares? But here's the thing: we turn down interviews all the time of people who have tons of followers online just because we have to say no to a lot so we can say yes to the most important things however there are occasionally people who come to me and and you know it's like i'm working on this phd dissertation on minimalism and here's why it would be really important to have you involved in this and they don't have any twitter followers or anything but there's a compelling case to make and i think the point is that yes it may it may remove some friction to have to, to, to have more of those followers, but I'm worried less about removing friction. I'm, I'm worried more about gaining traction. Mm-hmm. And, and what you, so you need a little bit of friction to create that traction. So you talked about having those challenges. Uh, yeah, some of those challenges are what makes the thing interesting. Yeah, I, I think limitations breed creativity. It's one of the reasons I think the documentary turned out so well. And if we would have had a $20 million budget to make the documentary, hell, if we would have had a $1 million budget to make the documentary, <laughs> yeah. We, I don't know that we would have made as good of a final product. We may have, we may have not, because it wouldn't have been the same sort of bootstrap thing that, that it was. It may have not had the same essence. It may have looked, you know, amazing, and you may, I don't know, you had some flaming baseball bats in it or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but it, it may have, may have lost what made it, what made it beautiful. Yeah, and I, I'm glad that you brought up the rock, because this, this to me is. It's, it's kind of just a crazy, unrealistic goal. Like, why would The Rock want to come on my podcast? Right. You guys seem to do a pretty good job of uh, getting your message out there and, and sharing it. And in what way do you think I could get The Rock on this podcast? Like, come <laughs> over to my apartment and, like, Whoa. literally it'd just be me and him yeah. and uh, have a conversation about how he, how he built his, his So, life. you know, I think for Josh and I, um, you know, thinking about the documentary and how we were able to get people, like, you know, uh, Sam Harris and Dan Harris, uh, to be on the, on, on, in the documentary, it's because like we had something to offer them. Mm. It wasn't just, Hey, will you be on my show to help my show be, you know, to have more, more clout or so I can get more listeners. It was, Hey, we have an audience. This is our first feature length documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, w- you know, we have high standards. We don't really have any expectations, but, but it's going to be a great film. Would you like to be part of this? We'd love to introduce you to our audience. So um, I don't think there's anything wrong with asking, but it's kind of the problem with you millennials, man. You think you can just ask for it? And get yeah. It. <laughs> I mean, well, I, it, it isn't. It, and part of the thing is like the the Ryan left out there is that you add value first, yeah. and so. Mm-hmm. Uh, give you examples so with Sam Harris and Dan Harris in particular. They both have books come out in 2014, and I said I, I reached out to both of them. And said, "Hey, we we would love to review your book for you and and give you a, give an honest review. Uh, I'd love to do an interview with you about it as well. And don't want anything in return. Just want to be able to to give this to to our audience because I found value in both of your books. So Waking Up and 10 Percent Happier, yeah. and." And I said, great. And then they saw that it got a good response. And then 
it made them more willing to to do something uh, like the documentary. For, like the documentary. And mm-hmm. now, by the way, the documentary has done so well for them. You know, Dan Harris. We were with him in New York a couple of weeks ago, and he said, "I've never been recognized from more from one media thing in my." Ent- and he's a guy who's on TV five, six days a week. Yeah, the whole time job serious? is media. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And he said, <laughs> wow. "I've never been recognized more from one thing." And he goes, "I was talking to Sam about this, and Sam said the same thing." No. Yeah, and Sam. That's amazing. That awesome, <laughs> yeah, Sam that's so e- cool. emailed me last month. He's like, "Hey, can I get a copy of your writer for the tour? So I'd like to make sure I'm doing this the tour I'm doing correctly." And so, like, it's about adding value. But he- here's mm. here's here's the key without any expectation of getting something back. It's not quid pro quo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because he, here's the other thing. That's the secret. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, you want to be able to add value to someone's someone's life and, and realize that you may not get the same amount of value back. But, but you may, like for me, like the David Foster Wallace thing we talked about earlier, there's literally no way I can pay him back because he's no longer alive. And by the way, even if he was alive, you know, Mary Carr is another writer who I really look up to. I think her work is phenomenal. I think she's the best memoirist to ever live. And and I look at her writing. There's nothing I could do that would add more value to her life than than she's added to my life in terms of shaping my writing. And so the only thing I could do is try to add value to other people's lives instead. Yeah. So so like when it comes to the rock, the the question isn't like how can I come up with this hashtag campaign yeah. to get the rock's attention. Like the best way to get someone's attention is to add value to their lives. Yeah, mm. and there there is a hashtag though. It's called Get the Rock on Matt's Podcast. Right, right. <laughs> Same website, get the rock on Matt's Podcast.com. Uh, but I actually did buy it. That's <laughs> it was awesome. the best twenty dollars I ever spent. That's awesome. Um but the, the I think uh you I actually I got a really good idea, I think, from just this conversation. And and my takeaway is make the rock smile. And that's like my my bare minimum is like mm. I want to touch the rock. Not literally. <laughs> that would be creepy. Uh, uh, can we can we just get that into a three second yes. Instagram video? I keep doing this. I keep like, uh, I, yeah. Uh, I gotta I gotta watch out for those sound bites. They'll get you. Anyway, so, so you, you left off it. You wanted to touch the rock. I wanted to touch the rock <laughs> emotionally, but like, so if I can make a video in some way that he sees that makes him smile, that makes him laugh, because like, what can, like I, I I'm not gonna do anything, you know. Make his it, career isn't going to be made when he comes on my podcast. Like, there's not, I don't have that value to add, but there's maybe something else that I can give him. But yeah, you know what, man? Making, numbers. Yeah, making somebody laugh, like, that is totally adding value. I mean, yeah. that's, that, that is one step closer than just. <laughs> my brother, my brother yeah. suggested that I interview an actual codfish. Cause I don't know if you guys know, but he eats like eight pounds of codfish every day. Oh, wow. So it's like, maybe what? I could do that, like, understand the enemy, <laughs> the rock's enemy, <laughs> and then put a podcast episode where it's just me talking, talking to a talking codfish. To a cod. That is pretty funny. There's yeah. a lot of ideas. I, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. You guys have really figured out a way, which I'm still learning, to balance creating meaningful work and also having really healthy productive habits in your personal lives and Mm. and like it seems like there's a really beautiful blend between your personal work lives where it's almost like you couldn't even draw the line um what are some of the the i guess most helpful habits you guys have developed i think work-life balance is sort of overrated in, in many ways because it presupposes that you have like two different selves and they're sitting in separate offices or something like well here's my and and that was actually a big problem for me when i was in my 20s i had professional jfm and then personal jfm and and for me it was like the personal side i wanted to i wanted to be a writer i wanted to write and i did that whenever i had spare time but of course you wouldn't talk about that in the corporate world because in a weird way they almost discourage that kind of creativity like well, why are you doing that seems like a waste of time why aren't you spending more time networking or, or whatever and and what I realized, like that was unhealthy for me to have these two separate selves. And so now it's more about being integrated. So you can call it work-life balance or whatever, but we use the word habits earlier. And, and I, I agree that I have some, some pretty good habits, but I think it goes back to what Ryan was just saying is a, a lot of it just has to do with saying, uh, managing your time. And so, so for me, that just means saying no to virtually everything. Usually we do only we'll do only like one sort of media thing a week. We're, we're doing we're actually doing three this week. I we said yes to three, which is a very rare thing. We spoke at Google yesterday, and uh, we're doing the Today Show later this afternoon uh, for the Australian tour. So Australia Today Show, 
and then we're doing the Ground Up podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, up, it's an up-and-coming podcast. I've heard about it. <laughs> yes, yes. You hear that, The Rock? <laughs> the Ground Up show. You got to do Matt's podcast. Anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, so so I'll say no to a whole lot because I know what I'm saying yes to. And, and if I think if you get really clear on what you're saying yes to, and by the way, I still screw up all the time, and I accidentally say yes to things I should have said no to. And even now, I'll say yes to something, and... It, like we'll do an interview somewhere and I'm like, oh, that was supposed to be way different from what it, how it was pitched to us. And had I had all the relevant data, I would have said no to this thing. But you lesson learned and, and you, you move on and, and try to incorporate that lesson going forward. You but, know what questions to ask next time. Yeah, we've certainly had that happen. So I think it's weird. Like so when we first started, we said yes to virtually everything. I think it's about saying until you reach this delta where you have to start saying no. And so it was yes, yes. Anyone, if someone had two Twitter followers, want to interview me, I'd be like, heck yeah. If someone wants to listen to me, great. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I'll say yes as much as I can because I'm growing. I'm, I'm learning from that, uh, from that experience. But eventually you get to a point where you have to start saying no. And then you figure out what you're saying yes to. What are the most important things? At first, it's important to say yes as much as you can just to, to sort of build up that, that, that creative ability to, I mean, if you're doing a podcast, you want to be able to, to interview other people and so say, to say yes, yes, yes. Until you get good at that aesthetic. You, one day, you know, Charlie Rose didn't become Charlie Rose overnight. And now he has to be selective to who he says yes to, because it can negatively impact his show. If he's saying yes to anyone who's just on the street, who wants to be interviewed. Yeah. I, I think, I don't know if this is a habit as much uh, as it is a tool, but dude, my calendar is like, that's my Bible. I mean, at the beginning mm -hmm. of every week, uh, Mar Mariah and I, we will look at our week and be like, okay, let's plan out our week. And then every night before I go to bed, I am looking at that. And if I don't use my calendar, I will double book myself. I will be late to stuff. I won't even show up to stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I had to learn uh, that lesson, uh, uh, that hard lesson many times before I finally started treating my yeah. calendar like my Bible. Yeah, that's like one of those, the very unsexy things about entrepreneurship uh, and running your own business. And I mean, even if you're trying to, keep track of your personal life, you got to have a calendar. And yeah. I recently did it where I had uh, different Google accounts. I had my personal, my business, and I had like a separate one, like another, my, my personal website. Mm -hmm. And it was like all three of these and my calendars were different on each. And then I just took an entire day where I'm like, I need to get this shit straight. I'm going to go through and I'm going to combine all these things. I'm going to set forwarding filters. So if somebody emails my business, it still comes into my main inbox, but it comes into a separate folder and it's organized nice, nice and neat away. Mm -hmm. I did the same thing with my calendar. Calendars. And like the peace of mind I have now to know that I'm not confused with what I'm doing this week, what I'm doing later today, uh, is super helpful. It takes away it, it takes away the, uh, a lot of stress. It, it it makes room for other good stresses, I guess. But yeah, uh, like the actual creative pursuits you're trying to do. No, I think talking yeah. about the banality of being an entrepreneur though is really really important because you know you said at the beginning of this podcast, you know I'm sure people want to do what you do, and I have you know, mentoring students who will say. Man, I just teach me to do what you do, and I'm like, I don't know if you want to do what I do, because you know what what most people see is uh, or hear. They'll hear this recording, they'll see the video, they'll watch the documentary. They they don't understand all of the banal things that have to be done in order to make all that happen. Something as simple as making sure that your calendar is straight and that you are uh, committing to it and using that calendar to enter in every single appointment, whether it's business or whether it's, you know, going to, to, I mean, there was a point where I literally, I'm going to work out, I'm going to read, I'm going to write, I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, ha, uh, uh, have a mentoring client. Um, I don't, I'm not as uh, militant with it now. Uh, meaning like I, if I have a free block, I, there are three things that I'm going to do with the free block. I'm going to read, I'm going to write, or I'm going to go work out. Um, so I, I just, you know, I, I will keep that, uh, keep those blocks open during the week. But my point is, is that Josh and I, we still work some, some weeks, we'll still work 60, 70 hours, uh, and it's really, really tough. Like, we're living the dream, but the catch with living the dream is you have to work your ass off. And those banal things are, are, are part of that. On that note, let's get to quick questions. It's the one and only segment of this podcast where I ask questions, 
quickly, and you guys just answer them however you want. I, okay. I haven't. I got to really come up with a good catchphrase to introduce it, but that's basically how it goes. We call it the lightning round on our podcast. So since we're we're, we're cross publishing this, we'll call this the hashtag Ask the Minimalist Lightning Round. This is where we answer questions from social media. We're at the Minimalists on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. <laughs> Fantastic. See, you guys you guys have been doing this over 100 episodes. I'm only about 30 in right now. By the so. way, we call these Minimal Maxims. Jessica yeah. set up a website called minimalmaxims.com. So all of our pithy answers, they're less than 140 characters. Um, you can find them all right there as well. That's great. Let's do that. We'll, we'll keep it pithy cool. um, on these quick questions. Question number one, what's the simplest advice that's the most important to follow? You can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. Dude, if there's one message that Josh and I are really trying to get people to understand, it would be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Let's say somebody's stuck in a career that they, they're really not happy with. They're not fulfilled. Okay. We're talking to that person. What can they do today to turn their life around, to, to start in the right direction? The most important thing for that person, they probably know what they need to do. They need to do it. I mean, a, a lot of my uh, mentoring students, you know, when they when they come to me and they're like, "Oh, I want to, I want to paint, and I want to finish this book," but I, you know, I'm also working full time. And then, like, I will talk through to them. Pick one thing to focus on, and actually put in the work. Yeah, if I were to just pin that a little bit, I, I would say. Don't just know what you want to know, what what you want to do. Know why you want to do it, and and quite often we think we want to do something, but we don't realize the why behind it, and that is, and therefore we lose the leverage long term. If we if we if we don't know why we're doing what we're doing, we'll keep doing it for a while. But like I said earlier, you end up in the passenger seat of your own life, and all of a sudden you're like, well, wait a minute, I, I'm not in control of this thing. I'm doing this thing I thought I was supposed to do, but I don't even know why I'm doing this. So get clear on the why. That, I just realized that for myself and it, it came with a simple habit as uh, waking up early. Mm. So waking up early is one of those things that I've struggled with my entire life, especially as a, a filmmaker, a freelance filmmaker. I always wanted to be the person to wake up early. And when I did, I loved it. Waking up at 5, 6 a.m. was just, I felt so productive. I got more done by 11 a.m. than I did most days, most weeks combined. <laughs> I wish I could sleep in until 6 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> but then recently, past two months, I've been waking up at five five thirty a.m every single day without fail and it's because i got clear on the why it was because uh, i was i had work to do every day that i was passionate about because I, yeah. I wake up thinking about that i wake up i'm like oh i want to sit down at my desk and start working on it that's it, beautiful yeah and and honestly that's the biggest thing before i didn't have anything i'd wake up and i would have no work to do i'd have nothing that i was passionate about and i would just hit the snooze button and eventually go back to bed. Yeah, because there was nothing compelling enough to, to make you get there. So that's the other thing. Find something compelling, and that's usually within the why. Ooh, yeah. that's pithy. That's good. Ooh, damn. Write that down, podcast, Sean, wherever you are right now. <laughs> um, where do you guys go when you're feeling doubt? I can tell you where I went recently. Like, literally, there's a physical place I went. So we, we just moved out to to Los Angeles. I've been having a lot of health issues the last couple of years, and uh, we started renting this apartment, but I, I've been, I have weird chemical sensitivities and so we can't stay there and uh i was all alone one week and i just went out to uh, the museum the lacma down the street and just walked around and like like because you know it's it's you're not supposed to like have your phone out and all these other things and like it was like this place of intentional distraction but it allowed sort of my mind to wander in a way where it wasn't meditation but it was meditative in a way and uh sort of clear my thoughts uh, when I was back in Ohio, it, it was weird. I, I would I would just walk around. There was a neighborhood that I would walk around all the time, um, and and I develop a pattern of of sort of thinking. And so I find for me that that you can't think your way out of problems, but if you need to collect your thoughts first, um, yeah, having going out for a long walk, like a five, six, eight mile walk, um, allows me to collect those thoughts. Yeah, I mean. I have the type of mind that, like, when I leave here, when we're done with this podcast, he has I'm, a really good brain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. they're the best words. I'm gonna start. Yeah, I'm gonna start neurosing over it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be like, man, I should have said this. I rambled too much. I shouldn't have said that. Oh man, there's that one thing. I, I can kind of 
create my own reality in a way. Meaning, if I walk away from here and I say this was a shitty interview or this that was a shitty podcast, Ryan, you really did a bad job. Guess what? That's going to be true. If I walk away and I say, hey, you know what, man? Maybe it wasn't the perfect podcast, but there were some really good points from it, and it was fun, and we had a good time, and you know what? There is going to be someone out there who gets something out of it. That's also true. So what I've been able to do over the last like seven, eight years is really learn how to control that muscle. It started with um, uh, like a rubber band type thing, flicking myself on the wrist when I would get negative thoughts, or uh, there's this thing called the Pavlock that it will like give you a little bit of a shock um, for, you know, if you're trying to break a habit. But I would, I would literally catch myself in those thoughts and do something like that uh, and then try to redirect what those thoughts are. Now, what I'll also say is that anytime I do feel doubt, I will acknowledge it. I don't just pretend that like, Ryan, you shouldn't doubt yourself. Just think positive. Yeah, you're um, not lying to yourself. Right. I'm not lying to myself. It's about looking at that doubt and, and being able to uh, confront it head on and either take something away, learn something from it, or be able to like look at that doubt and just kind of plow through and be like, dude, this doubt is not serving me any purpose. So um, where do I go? I guess I just go to a rubber band. I don't know. <laughs> I, go to my, I go to my own thoughts. Well, I, I think you brought up something that was important there. When you're talking about don't lie to yourself, like that, I, cause I, I face the same thing. And sometimes those negative emotions are productive. So it's not, I don't want to lie to myself. Everything's positive. Everything I do is great. Every time my right. quill touches the page, I write something that is legendary. No, the truth is most of the stuff I write is garbage. Literally, like I have to throw it away. Um, it reaches the trash can. And that's okay because you, it requires that sort of plethora of sediment if you're going to pan for gold. There's going to be a lot of sediment before you find find the gold. And oh, that's that's pithy. That's that's tweetable right there. <laughs> um, and and so I think it's important not to lie to ourselves and say, man, everything is great, great, great. But at the same time, I think we lie to ourselves the other uh, the other way too. We're like, that was awful. Everything's so bad. It yeah. was terrible. No, it wasn't awful. The truth is, it was okay. And and what can I learn from the fact that it was okay? Let's not lie to ourselves on either side of it. Right. What drives you? Why do you put in the work? It's it's a net positive like that's the work that I do will always be a net positive and you know what I mean is like it's it's rough being on tour it's rough going from one city you know uh, getting there a few hours before the show do a sound check go get dinner do the show go to bed at midnight get up at 6 a.m. rinse repeat uh, for, you know two three four days in a row but when we get there, when we get on stage, um, you know, when we have the hug line and, and you can just see how, how positive Josh and I have influenced people. Like for me, like that is what makes it, ma makes it uh, worthwhile. That is why I will put in the work. Now, if Josh and I were putting in all this work and no one was showing up, and even though we thought it was really meaningful work, uh, you know, we had zero people attending, like then it would be a net negative. Like, okay, this work that we're doing isn't doing anything. Um, but man, yeah, for me, it's about, it's about the work that I put in each day. I just want it to be a net positive. And for me, that means that ultimately what I do aligns with, with my values and beliefs that all those short-term actions, all those difficult uh, the, the, ban the banal things that we have to do as entrepreneurs, um, it all aligns with my long-term values and beliefs. And like that for me is how I, I live a meaningful life. I, I think, I think the thing that drives me is, is, has, it was two things actually. And they're contradictory. One is, is improving. So improving whatever I'm doing. So writing is, is one example. Like I was a pretty good writer in my twenties. In fact, uh, there are parts in the novel I wrote, it's called as a decade fades and I don't recommend people read it, but it's, um, um, there are parts in there that are better than anything I could write right now because it was a different mind frame. And I spent many years like chiseling away certain paragraphs and pages. And, and there are parts in there that are truly gorgeous that I'm just not in that mind frame anymore. But as a writer overall, I'm leaps and bounds better than that, that bit of work that was created throughout my, my mid twenties. And, and I've, continue to improve so you can call it growth you can call it personal development or whatever I'll, I'll just call it improvement for the sake of this uh, and wanting to improve wanting to get better not to get perfect but 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 to to become better than what I was yesterday at whatever that creative endeavor is so podcasting was a low-hanging fruit because we weren't we were 
pretty bad at it at first. Um, we were good at answering questions and we had done a lot of interviews, but when you become a broadcaster, I was just talking to Bex about this the other day, like there are some people who are really great public speakers and it doesn't translate well to podcasting because podcasting is a type of broadcasting and you need to have broadcasting chops and you turn these microphones on and it becomes a totally different uh, a different thing and it's not as solitary as writing it re- requires this more uh, uh, direct one-on-one uh, experience it's still communicative communicative to an audience but but it's different I want to get better at something like that when we're on tour like getting better at public speaking that's one thing that terrified me for the longest time and it doesn't anymore uh, but it was about getting better at that the other thing that, that drives me is, is service like be, being able to contribute to other people and, and whether that's through our books or website or podcast or, or the live events, um, it, it's, it's about finding a way to contribute to other people. And I, I think it, it almost sounds like a, a, a truism that giving is living, but, but when, you, when you find the ways to contribute to other people, you know, we're, we're doing some stuff with the hurricane relief efforts in uh, Houston and then um, also uh, donating personally to the Puerto Rico stuff and then um, what's go- going on in Vegas? We're trying to set up a, a, a event for that with everything that happened with the, 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 the shooting, the mass shooting in, in Vegas. Finding ways to contribute like that to uh, after tragedies, but also just trying to contribute to people in general. Uh, find ways to serve them and make, make their lives better. And we're able to do that through our message. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll say like in the corporate world, the one thing I loved about my job, it was it was the mentoring. It was taking that that employee who was getting ready to get fired and then helping them turn it around to where three months later they were getting employee of the month, like helping someone uh, to make a significant change in their lives. Like that is the one thing I absolutely loved. And that is pretty much my job now, really. I'm really impressed at what you guys have been able to do and the consistency of delivering an amazing and beautiful message of simple living and and inspiring others to uh, live more meaningful lives. And I'm curious if you look back, is there one skill that you guys have developed and locked in on that you think you've been able to cultivate in a way that others haven't? I don't really look in the mirror and see any skill that I have that is, you know, above and beyond what anyone else has. And like, that's good news because, you know, I'm looking in the mirror and I'm going, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think if there's, if there's anything that, um, you know, like a, a, like a tip that I could give any entrepreneur out there, it would be like, surround yourself with people who you want to be like. Like when I think about the people that I spend most of my time with, they are people who, when I look at their life, I'm like, man, that's a, that's a really, that's a really good life. And that person's, you know, really smart at this. They're really good at that. And like, there's some, there's some way that I look up to them and don't necessarily want to be them, but, but there is an aspect to where I totally look up to them and, and vice versa. It's like, I don't just, you know, I'm not just a succubus with all my friends. Like I will try to add as much value, uh, as much value as possible just so that I'm not just taking from these relationships. But I got to tell you, man, like looking at my 25 year old self, I can't tell you how many people I hung out with and there's no way in hell I would ever want to live their life. And like thinking back, I'm like, why would I ever hang out? If I'm hanging out with someone and I'm looking at them and thinking, this is a life I never want to live. Your life looks miserable. Uh, like why would I invest time in, into developing a, a long-term friendship with that person? I'm not saying that I should treat that person poorly, but in order to help myself grow to get better at, at whatever skills, I've got to surround myself with people who have the skills that I want to emulate and I, and I look up to in a certain way that helps me to, to grow. But ultimately, man, for you or anyone else out there, like if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> All right. On that note, thank you guys so much for being on the podcast. Thanks it's for having us, man. It's been a lot of fun. Man, this really has been a dream come true for you. <laughs> yeah, it really has. Uh, <laughs> this is going to go in my memoir. It's going to be page yes. one. But I'm going to make sure to cut out the first two paragraphs. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, once again, thanks again for coming on. Uh, one last thing I do with every guest. Uh, where should people go to connect with you? Well, we're on tour right now. So if you want to come see us in Australia and New Zealand, we just announced that. Lessisnow.com is the tour page. Uh, Theminimalists.com is always the best place to find our books, podcasts, essays, and Instagrams, Twitters, all that fun stuff. Yik Yak. Are we on Yik Yak? 
<laughs> yik yak still a thing? I don't it even know, be. dude. <laughs> I, don't right, even know, I don't even know what yik yak is. I just hear people say it and then I, I say it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks for listening to The Ground Up Show. If you like this podcast, there's something you can do right now to help. Head on over to iTunes and leave a quick review. I print out every single one and I put them up on my mood board above my bed. Okay, that's not true, but I still notice and appreciate every one. For more on The Ground Up Show, including behind the scenes videos, check out groundupshow.com. Thanks for listening.